he is here. He is, of course, I guess known as uh, an ambassador of, of the funk. Um, yeah, I didn't name myself. He didn't that, name himself but, uh, that, but. <laughs> but um, yeah. And uh, please welcome Dave Funk. Yes, everybody, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, of course. So what brings you to these territories besides doing this, this lecture? You did some shows? Yeah, I was in London uh, this week. Um, I came back from um, br uh, actually uh, this city uh, called Lisbon, Portugal. And that was a great gig. And I um, came to London and did Plan B uh, this weekend with um, friends of mine, uh, Benny Blanco out there, uh, Benji B, Mr. Wonderful, and um, a couple other cats and um, Alex Nutt, uh, we all had a good time. And um, yeah, that's what brought me out to the London area this time. Okay, so uh, you, you just said that you, you did not give yourself the title, the ambassador of funk, but you're very much into the funk. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Uh, funk is uh, something that <clears throat> I definitely um, am a, uh, a big proponent of. And uh, like I said, somebody, you know, gave me that name, the right. Ambassador Boogie Funk. I would have never named myself an ambassador, you know what I'm saying? That's one of the things I'm going to talk to you guys about today as far as being an artist and, um, you know, being in the game. Um, but I'll let you continue what you were going to say. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I was wondering maybe you can just play a little something from your repertoire to give um, the folks out here who might not be completely familiar with your work just an idea of what, uh, what you do. Yeah, no problem. Well, can I can I set it up first? Of course, the way I was absolutely. Playing? Okay, since uh, um, first of all, uh, much love. Let's give a round of applause for Jay Electronica. He'll be here tomorrow. One more time for him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he represents a fantastic genre of music, um, but there are some other genres that's out here, and um, that genre that I represent, and I don't mind having a genre as a tag or or a definition. I'm not one of those musicians that um, that does the, uh, oh yeah, I'm into all styles of music and yada yada. Yeah, I like that thing too when people say that. What's up, Alex? Um, but I'm, I'm a cat that like, uh, I like genres. I like names of genres. It's fun to me, you know what I'm saying? I don't wanna, I don't wanna uh, take the easy way out as an artist and like uh, say, uh, I like everything. I think that it's good when somebody stands for something. Everybody in this room, if you do a style of music, don't be afraid to stand up for that style that you do. Do that style, and then if you want to go do another style, you know, try that. You know what I'm saying? But stand for something. I mean, if you don't stand something, you'll fall for anything. I stand for funk. That's what I stand for. I, I'm, I'm proud to say I stand for the genre of funk, and I consider it to be modern funk. I'm not doing any other style right now in this particular um, uh, the avenue of my career, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm representing modern funk. I'm not doing chill wave. I'm not doing any of those those things that are popping up right now. This is funk, and I'm taking it to the next level. And um, so, with that being said, Jeff and and all my friends here, um, I just wanted to let you know that you know you can record the way you want to. You can use any kind of equipment that you want to. You don't have to do the um, uh, the state of the art instruments or the state of the art recording processes. The way I got in the game was doing stuff like on cassette tape, uh, on a real cheap Radio Shack mixer, and um, on cassette tapes. And uh, this is one of the things, one of the first recordings that I um, actually made um, in my bedroom back in. I saved these from cassette tapes, and it's just a trip to be able to play them for you now. Um, it may sound weird or funny, but this is the way I started off, just making weird tracks like this. And, um, and this goes back to like 1989, um, and that's how long I've been in the game. And I'm just getting my um, debut album out. So it just shows another thing that everybody in here, and you know, just bear with me as I talk to you. It's like this, everything I do, I really care about. So just bear with me when I'm telling you. I mean, if you have a dream, do not give up. Um, it's just, 
you, you don't ever let your mom or your dad or, or some friend or, or somebody who doesn't like care about you or you think they care about you, but you think they're steering you in the right direction. If you feel in your heart that this is the music that you want to do, this is your life's calling, do not give up. Somebody's going to try to stop you. Somebody's going to try to like say, like, don't you think you ought to try plan B? You know what I'm saying? Always don't do plan B. Stick with the first thing in your heart. If it's the music, just stick with it. So this is the kind of stuff that I start off with. Um, this is called You Can Do It If You Want To. Let's see if this thing works. Thank you very much, some, everybody. Some rare Dame Thank Funk you. demos right there. Yeah, yeah. So some, actually, some of that Jeff is going to be... Um, Coming out uh, on Stone's Throw under a title called Adolescent Funk in a couple months. So okay, look out good. for that. So um, how old were you when you were making these tracks? Um, that was, I'll say I was timeless, but uh, as I am now. But, uh, <laughs> but 1989 but, uh, is... Yeah, yeah, I was, right. I was I, I, I'll be fair. I was... Uh, at the, in, Approximate, in, in, you don't have to give specific oh, yeah, numbers. Yeah, it was in the middle of high school. Oh, okay. All yeah, right. so I've been around. And, and you know when I don't shave like today, it kind of can you can tell. But um, but I'm still young at heart, and you know, um, like I said, I'm 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 from the generation X. You you know what I'm saying? I mean, we were the generation that came before, you know, all the technology, Jeff, and you know, after everything was uh, primitive. So it's like I'm right in between, and um, you know, I can learn from some of the young people that I kick it with, and you know, and I can teach some of the people who came before me. Like for instance, um, I'm I'm producing an album now for. Uh, damn, I gave it away. I was gonna give away something, but um, <laughs> who can tell me right now? Can I do this, Jeff? Yeah, yeah, real yeah quick? Of, course, of course. Just to make it a little bit fun for everybody. Who can tell? I got the new album out with me. It's the double CD to each his own. I hope you guys dig it. Um, but if somebody can tell me who the lead singer of a group called Slave was, the first person I give the CD to him. Uh, I won the I won hand. this trivia contest in New York. Oh. Remember at, uh, at Academy. <laughs> That's right. That's, 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 right. that's the only way it gets done. So I, like the to, I like to use this question, though, because it's one yeah. of my favorite groups of all time. Yeah. But can anybody in this room tell me who the lead singer of a group called Slave was by raising their hand? Anybody. Slave from, from the great state of Ohio. Yes. yes. Which is a place where many, many influential funk artists exactly. are from. Anybody. Slave. Slave, anybody, funk they, group they slave. They made songs like he, uh, Just a Touch of Love, uh, Watching You, um, and then when he went solo, he made songs like uh, Weak at the Knees and um, Nobody Can Be You But You. And in, in, in London, you guys might know this song. He made a song called Dancing in the Key of Life. Still no one, huh? Okay, well, we'll, we'll save that for the next question. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, well, you are not from Ohio, sir. I'm from LA. You are from where? I'm from Los Angeles, yeah. But we love the funk on the West Coast, and that's what explains some of the things you just heard. I mean, it's like um, in L.A., we have a culture of uh, funk appreciation. Well, set the scene for me a little bit, which, and for all of us, rather. Um, you know, going back, you know, what, what was going on at that time when you first started getting into the music? Um, what was happening around you? And, um, you know, how did you come to, um, you know, get into this? specifically this this type of style? Well, uh, around the time I started this music playing and, and creating it, um, groups like, um, uh, actually, it was in the midst of hip hop, the era, the golden right. era. Yeah, right. uh, Eric B. and Rakim, uh, you know, EPMD, Slick Rick, um, those kind of cats were hitting on the hip hop scene. We had a station in LA called K-Day. It was um, one of the first hip hop radio stations that ever played uh, hip hop for 24 hours, but I'm not gonna try to mix this up and 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 make you guys feel good about this hip hop love. I mean, we were more funksters, you know what I'm saying? We we grew up on Prince, Egyptian Lover, um, L.A. Dream Team, you know, Ready for the World, you know what I'm saying? That was the stuff we listened to. We liked hip hop as well, but it didn't rule our lives. Yeah, well, that's because you know L.A. Yeah. was a different type of scene that right, way. Right, it was a different scene. Yeah. Now, do you um? Do you remember like Uncle Jam's army and stuff like that? Yes. Can you explain to, to everybody Man. here what that was? I mean, you guys, you talk about like the LA sports arena packed with like 20,000 people, just nothing but people dancing and like 
you, you guys have heard of Egyptian Lover, right? Of course. Okay, so, I mean, this dude was a local, this is another thing for like people who are just, you know, getting into this thing and becoming artists and, or have been artists and just learning from today and being at Red Bull. It's like, you can have a great regional scene. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to be popular every single place. This dude was packing like arenas, man. And you know, like it, it was just a, a situation, you know, they would have like full blown out shows with outfits, the choreographed steps. And um, it was just a big social scene. They even did it in Pasadena where I grew up at was a little bit outside of Los Angeles and they would come to Civic Center and uh, you know, then they would start, um, you know, just having some fun. I mean, but then some of it was interesting because like where I grew up, like in LA, um, we had a gang culture. And um, unfortunately, sometimes, you know, those kind of parties got out of control, you know, and on a Sunday, just think about it, on a Sunday, we would have these big parties, not Saturdays, but Sundays in the daytime. And um, if you, you knew the party was the bomb, if if some shots got popped off, it's a shame, but that's just the way it was. If you, when you, if you found yourself running home on Sunday afternoon, when Knee Deep from Funkadelic was playing, you knew that it was a great party. I know it sounds silly, but that's just the way it was. And um, Egyptian Lover and, and that kind of funk was a part of the backdrop of times when I grew up in the early 80s and mid 80s in Pasadena and Los Angeles. And, uh, and then hip hop started coming and you know, Dr. Dre and those cats, they didn't start slowing down the tempos until like, you know, 89 or 90. Yeah, you know, everybody was up tempo. Yeah, because, um you know, the LA, early LA hip hop was a lot more informed by electro and yes. stuff like that. And it really wasn't until Dre came in with, um, and I guess. Ice maybe, tea. Yeah, and Ice tea and. Six in the morning. Yeah. You guys know that? Have you ever heard that track? Six in the morning from Ice. I don't want to start quizzing everybody, but <laughs> I mean, this is some of the essential stuff. There'll be a written quiz later. Okay, actually. okay no yeah, problem. So, no problem. So, don't worry. No problem. No, um, I saw it good. I saw it good. Um, so. I guess uh, you know maintaining you know your your focus on what you were doing and how did how did you sort of uh, uh, you know withstand the trends and and how things were changing um, you know as far as hip hop being more dominant you know on uh, in L A and stuff like that I mean did the, the, the funk stuff like you know always have its uh, champions you know such as yourself or um, you know did it kind of like um, you know did you catch flack for sort of not going with the hip hop thing full throttle, you know what I mean? Um, well, at first I was, no no flack, I mean, um, I think in what it was in my neighborhood, there was like athletes, you know, musicians, and there was, I'm sure this is with everybody's neighborhood, you know, there's always like, you know, those, those categories that people were in, you know, and I was just a musician who, you know, was still a part of a clique that was, you know, cool you know what I'm saying and um but I was still able to do the musician thing mm -hmm. and um and but I was into a lot of genres as well like I was into metal um and I was into new wave I was into uh, all types of stuff but funk just seemed to be the one that got me so like when hip-hop came out or it got popular rather in LA um some of the first demos I made man were like um like over instrumentals from I Need a Beat from LL Cool J. Uh, me and my friends just like, you know, play that and I would tape loop it and pause it and we would rap on top of it. And those are like my first productions, just just recording stuff on uh, wax, you know what I mean? And then I started putting those tapes out and mm -hmm. to my friends and, uh, and then after a while I was like, man, I, I'm, I'm digging this Roger Troutman is Zap stuff. Because in the neighborhood, like Nissan trucks were very popular, these pickup trucks. And a lot of the, you know, like cats that were hustlers, they used to get like the sound systems in their car. So the only stuff that sounded good in the car in our neighborhoods that bumped was like more bounce of the ounce. If you came up playing more bounce of the ounce from Zap, you just got the girls, you, 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 it just sounded right. You know what I'm saying? It, you didn't really sound too cool uh, with some of the East Coast hip hop stuff. You know what I'm saying? You had to have some funk like Atomic Dog or, you know, or, or that kind of thing. So when I started realizing that it's a slightly different style, I, I, you know, I, I started looking more for like funk, you know, but it was hard to find the record stores. And um, so eventually I started, I always went to a record store called Poobaz in Pasadena. Poobaz exists, exists now. 
but there's a new vet level to Pooh Bahs. So Pooh Bahs was the first record store that, that, like, I was the first kid who actually worked there. This is another little side history. I mean, like, the Pooh Bahs you know now, I was the first young guy that actually worked at that place. You know what I'm saying? And, and the guy, Jay Green, who originally owned it, he just um, showed me the ropes about, like, how to, you know, run a business. You know, he always kept the record prices low. Okay. And it, was, it beat the other record stores, you know what I'm saying? Because they always tried to charge a lot, but you keep it low so that everybody comes to your store. Then he started buying more funk. And um, it, it, and when I got more into that, you know, it just showed that um, there is a great style out here that, that I can be a part of. And I started recording those tapes of compilations and passing out to my friends at school. And, um, and that's how, after the metal thing, after being into Rush and all those kind of groups and Kiss posters and mm -hmm. Iron Maiden, you know, I was just into music, man. I love music, you know what I'm saying? Now, um, you did do some, um, I guess, apprenticeships, right? And you got some session work as well yeah. off of that. Can you talk a little bit about um, that as far as getting a foot in the door um, for your career? That's a good point, y'all. Um, it's okay to actually uh, hook up with somebody that's more experienced than you to help you get into the game and just show you the roles. Mine was uh, Leon Silvers. Uh, he was a producer for the Solar record label. They produced groups like Shalimar, who was big in London. Um, Everybody know Solar Records? Sound of Los Angeles Records. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt mm -mm. as you drink your beverage. That was a great Red Bull break. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, continue with, with Leon Silvers. Well, yeah, he, yeah. he produced groups like Dynasty, uh, Midnight Star, um, uh, a lot of people. But the point is, is that, uh, you know, it's for such a, he actually was the bass player and in, in the um, writer of songs like Misdemeanor, which heavily uh, sampled. Of course, you know, everyone's hero, rest in peace, Jay Dilla sampled that for the Donuts album. I mean, um, so, you know, I worked with some cats that really knew what was happening. You know what I'm saying? And he showed me about, like, how to deal. What I'm, why I'm telling you this is because um, if you want to make moves and strides in the game, it's, like, good to connect with people who already know. Don't look at the elders as, like, you know, that old dude, he doesn't know what's going on. The game has changed, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's, like, do not ever do that because they can really share some wealth, you know what I'm saying, wisdom with you. And I, I always respected elders. That's one thing I can pride myself on. I never like looked at the old guys as like, get out of here, man. My little warbly beats are better than yours. You know what I'm saying? You're old school. I'm doing dubstep now. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I never looked at the, I mean, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's like, you, you should never do that, you know what I mean? Because these cats are walking around with, they might not have the chips or, 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 or connections that you do now, but they have the wisdom. So I would just suggest, you know, listen to some of the older cats. They really can help you. Just a little tidbits of information. And uh, go, that goes back to my thing I was going to say before, where everybody uh, lost the quiz. No big deal. We'll do another one. But... Uh, but I, I respect everybody's in there. It's a lot to check out. There's too much music out there, so I know you, why you didn't know the answer. But I'm working with this cat named Steve Arrington. He's the lead singer of uh, Slave. And, and why I went back and got him is because I respect my elders, and he still got it. He's 53 years old and still killing the game more soulful vocals than anybody I've heard out right now. And, and it just shows, if you guys hook up with somebody and you know somebody that's good in your neighborhood or like an older cat or if you're a producer, give them a shot. You see homegirl from uh, uh, American Idol, you know what I'm saying? And she's like destroying on the record sales and whatever. It's just don't give up on the elders. That's my point. So, yeah. So, um, that's, that's pretty cool actually, Steve Arrington. Um, what, I'm just at as a side note. So what is, what is, what was Steve up to? Um, recently was he still in music doing anything or? yeah he, he went on to do some uh, uh stuff uh he was became a minister he got away from the game for a minute and uh you know got deep off into that and uh but now he's coming back into it because he which really humbled me and and which showed me that i'm doing something right is that he said he was looking at some videos 
on YouTube and stuff and like got familiar with the, you know, what I was doing. He was already aware of what I was doing into the funk and and I, I always respected him and me and Peanut Butter Wolf of Stone's Throw, um, he which is the guy who I owe a lot of my current exposure, uh, I don't want to say success, but I just want to say exposure to my friends that I share music with. I owe a lot to Peanut Butter Wolf because he gave me my shot to get familiar with you folks and, and more people worldwide to share this music that you just heard being made in the bedroom since 1988. It's like he, me and him always like Steve Arrington's vocals and um, he's going to be putting this album out on Stone's Throw Records and I got the full production on it. So. Yeah. yeah, that's that's gonna be uh, pretty cool. Um, I guess uh, I want I mentioned the session work that you did. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah. You know what sort of stuff you were doing mm -hmm. um, for what sort of artists and uh, oh. how you got into that? Well, yeah, Jeff. Eventually, I um after Leon Silvers, um, and I'm just this is an interesting story because we've gone from like you know the cassette tape stuff, you know, in high school making tapes with friends you know, posters on the wall in my bedroom of Kiss and Iron Maiden and, you know, and then uh, Prince posters as well. Um, every Tuesday when new record, when the record stores came out with the new releases, I would always, I would ditch school to buy the new Prince album. I would just like make an excuse. Like, you know, I had good grades. That's another thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> This song is gonna make sense, Jeff. Everybody, I gotta explain this to you. It's like, see, in order, this is another, I do not, I want everybody in here, to, everybody of course is out of school, I think, but it's like, if you're not cool, but it's like, oh, don't let the next man like make you think it is cool to do bad in school. You can still be cool, but you can still pass. You can still get good grades. That's the way you do it. It's like, I got good grades, so I was able to be in a program where you got off at 12 noon. So, uh, but even if I wasn't off at 12 noon, I would be at that record store and I would get the new Prince album when it came out, all the way from like uh, Parade, Sign of the Times, everything. I would just be on my moped and I would go get the album and I would go home and I would sit in the chair and I would know my parents weren't there because, you know, I was a latchkey kid, so they got off of work later. So um, I would just open up my windows and I would sit in my chair and just listen to Prince and like, you know, just rock back and forth in the chair. This is where I got all the stuff that I have inside because music was my friend. And um, and I could tell it's your friends as well, music. And um, so, you know, after that point, I'll fast forward to the fact that I just got all this music in my head and then uh, worked at the record store, Pooh Bahs, and then did session work with Leon, learned a lot from him. And then I came back and I was like, man, what am I doing? Leon had me in a studio with Millie Vanilli. I'm like, what is this? But <laughs> I mean, but that was a learning experience as well. That was in Reno, Nevada. And um, it was before, you know, one of the members, unfortunately, uh, you know, um, did the wrong move. But, uh, you know, I learned a lot from those times. And then I came back to Pasadena. I was like, what's happening? What am I going to do with this? I'm going to go do the job. I'm going to do the driving trucks. I'm going to do the music. So I met a friend by the name of Binky in a group called All From The Eye. And um, he was from Inglewood. And he was signed with Mac 10. He's a popular rapper that was in the LA area in the 90s on Priority Records. And, and he got his start from Ice Cube. And uh, so eventually, um, I started, he, he knew what I was doing, playing keyboards, making the tapes, and then um, I started doing session work with uh, him, and then he, that turned into session work with MAG-10, that turned into session work with WC, then that turned into session work with Ice Cube, and then um, I got to know these cats, and you know, we respected each other. I got credit on the records under the name Dame, or Damon Riddick, or just, um, you know, Damon G. Riddick, and uh, I was playing keyboards, and I made some good money, and uh, but then I realized being in the studio sometimes, you know, like uh, with 20 dudes, you know, it, too many people in the studio. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like I was like, OK, this is cool, but I'd rather be just the cats. It's like actually making the music. It kind of distracts a little bit, you know, so but it was fun. But, you know, like I said, I survived. Nothing bad happened to me. I know there's horror stories that people have heard about with that whole era 
dude, I'm, they were professional. This is one thing I want to clear up about that whole West Coast rap scene at that time. They get a bum rap like they were animals. It wasn't like that. I got paid and everything was professional. So I'm saying, if you guys get a shady offer sometimes, treat people individually on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You know what I'm saying? Don't listen to what a lot of people said. Oh, you might need to do that. Just game recognize game. Treat somebody with respect and they'll treat you with respect. You know what I'm saying? And so if you do get a deal or an offer, look at it and weigh it and those options. And if you feel good in your gut that it's a good one, that's when you go for it because it paid off for me. Yeah, and those are the kind of people I did session work with, yeah. Okay, but along this time, um, were you able to, to have that support you more or less to be a session musician, or did you have to do day jobs as well in order to, um, to keep well, things going? Good question, Jeff. I mean, I always kept a day job because I like to have money. I always tell people that, you know, and it's like um, I never wanted to be one of the broke musicians, you know, but I do understand that there are broke musicians, and I understand that that's a part of the process and the artistic uh, avenue of, of, of being creative. But um, I just rather had wanted to keep money in my pocket. I drove trucks and I still recorded music at nighttime. And I, I, I drove across the freeway, you know, still had my day job. I had my radio radio on my, on my side of my truck, you know what I'm saying? And was still listening to stuff I was doing. I was always working because I wanted to keep my apartment. I left home at 18 and I never went back. You know what I'm saying? I never wanted to be that cat to like go back to pops and like, yeah, yeah, you, you think it's time to be the trash? I just, if he, if I ever would have went back home and inherit that, I just would have probably slashed my throat. No, I would never do that. But you know what I'm saying? I just wouldn't want to give my dad yes, the yes. chance to say that. You know what I'm saying? So I always tried to keep money in my pocket while I was pursuing music. Plus, I wanted to prove to him, and you know, the fellas in here can know about that, that son and father's struggle. It's like, um, I just wanted to prove to him that I can do this. And it, it feels so good right now. <sighs> <laughs> it feels so good, right? <laughs> Thank you. This Much is like love. being Much this is like being on Oprah or something, right? <laughs> Just don't start weeping, okay? No, nah, never, never. Um, my eyes are dry. It's all good. So, um, were you uh, were you still like collecting keyboards and things like that at this time? Did you have it enough, you know, to sort of keep? Uh, Sort of, I know you have like uh, a studio with a lot of different vintage equipment and stuff like that. Um, you know, was that sort of something that you were able to do uh, along this time as well? Yeah, I collected keyboards all the while. I collected records, so I was doing both. I was collecting records and collecting uh, keyboards, and the keyboards I preferred were analog keyboards, um, such as the uh, Oberheim DX drum machines, the the Juno 60s, uh, the Juno series from Roland. Um, Moog, Source, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of weird keyboards that mm -hmm. I still use from then that you heard in the cassette tapes is what I used on this. I, I used all the keyboards. See, the reason why I, this album is interesting for myself and I, I love sharing it with you guys because this first record, I wanted to prove again all that stuff I just talked about tied into my pops and tied into having a job and tied into, you know, having the radio in my truck driving and all that stuff and the session work and the, the Leon Silvers and the, the, the my friends with the kiss posters on the wall and all that stuff is because I use those same instruments on this album that you have right now. All the way from 88, I had the same instruments that you heard using on this. And, and I recorded this record just like I did with the cassette tapes. I didn't use any logic. I didn't use Pro Tools. I used two CD recorders and a Radio Shack mixer and, uh, and, and a Pioneer DJ 800 mixer. That's what I use for this double CD that you hear. The mastering was, is what makes it sound good. When everybody in the room all the all the recording that you're doing definitely get a good mastering person because they can do wonders too but um the 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 uh, bulk of it is um it's just raw you know what i'm saying play it all the way through 
So there were more, more or less live takes from what, from what you were doing Yes, there. yes, no okay. looping. I, but I love looping, and I'm tired of seeing this. I mean, people thinking I'm against sampling. It's, it's not, I'm never against sampling. I love all ways of creating music. Seriously, I do. I was just explaining to the people out there that you can actually make an album the way I recorded it and have it... Uh, have it stand on its own legs. You know what I'm saying? You can record anything you, it, it, it should be actually champ, like it should be, people should be happy by me acknowledging that because what I'm trying to show is that you can record any way you want to. I've never said I'm against sampling or looping or any of that. I was trying to let like, you guys know in a double, like on Tantra, uh, a way that we're like, whatever, you know what I'm trying to say. Uh, it was like, to just show that you can record any way you want to, and it can stand on its own two feet, and um, and that's the way I did it. So if you're recording like on primitive equipment, as long as it sounds good and makes sense to the people on the other end, um, do it. You know what I'm saying? And maybe you'll have an executive producer, you know, realize, hey man, this is some cool stuff, like I did with Peanut Butter Wolf. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to play something off of the uh, the album? Actually, you want to share it? Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah. What I what I <clears throat> Obviously, you've gotten quite a lot of, comp of uh, acclaim off of this, off Thank of this you. record, Thank and you. the singles leading up to it. Um, I, I wonder if you can sort of also talk about the the sounds. Um, I mean, what is it about the sounds that you get from these particular instruments that appeals to you? Besides the fact that these are the sounds that you grew up with, um, these sounds that I recorded with because they're more warm. Okay. And um, it, it it's just it appeals to me because I like warm sounding pads. I like uh, uh, things that sound beautiful, but still street. See, my my thing that I like to do in my music is uh, is record stuff that um, I like to focus on the beauty of things. I'm not afraid to uh, to be beautiful. I know this sounds hilarious, but but I'm not. You heard it here first. <laughs> I'm not afraid to sound beautiful or embrace things that are beautiful. I don't. To me. It's like, it's nothing wrong with like touching that part of your heart like that, you know, where, you know, you think of sunsets or, you know, stars or, you know, um, and then you, but I still like to acknowledge, you know, the, 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 the beat, you know what I'm saying? For instance, tracks like this. Let's see if we can cue it up the right way. This is called uh, Brookside Park. The hardest dude can like get into it and then the most beautiful lady can get into it at the same time and that's what I'm trying to make both that that combination you know what I mean so that's Brookside Park all that was recorded live and uh using the Roland Juno one I'll give it up yeah, Roland you, Juno one <laughs> so break break down I guess a little bit of just like yeah what what are the pieces um what are the different elements involved in um putting something like that together the different elements would be um, just recording it, uh, like I said, live all the way through. I would program the drum machine first. That's the only thing that I usually sequence, uh, about 16 bars. And then um, uh, and after this session, we'll destroy the recording so that you know none of this can be heard elsewhere. Just kidding. No, um, I'm just kidding, y'all. Um, but yeah, drum machine first, and then the bass line, you know, and the chords. I would play both of those together in one take. So um, both keyboards I would have like this. Uh, yeah, you could just, I'll just, you know, play. I have my rig like this. So I'm doing the bass at the same time, my chords at the same time. And um, then I would go back uh, after I recorded that on the CD burner. Uh, standalone CD recorder, and then I would refinalize that CD. I'd take that CD out, put the other CD into the other CD player, and push play. And then I'll put a blank CD in the other recorder, and then push record on there, and then I'll run that track back, push play, and I'll keep recording stuff over and over. I mean, it's not a rocket science thing, you know, it's just um, something that, uh, that I like to do. And I have Pro Tools sitting on my shelf right now collecting dust. So this is just the way I like to record. One day I will put Pro Tools together, but maybe the next album, or maybe the next album I might just go high tech. I don't know. At this point, I can go high tech, but right yeah. now, I'm, I, I, I like the way that, that I record. It's like, if it ain't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. 
fix it. You, you yeah. understand what I'm saying? What about the vocals on that? What is that? How was that? The vocals were uh, vocoder, and um, and I did that uh, on a fantastic keyboard that we all know of called the Korg, Micro Korg. Um, I think that's a must-own for any musician. It's just a fantastic little keyboard. I mean, uh, it's a coffee table piece. I mean, it's definitely a classic. I want to give uh, much love to James Pants. Give it up for James Pants right there, James y'all. Pants. Behind there, yeah. Actually, that was right on cue because I bought the micro cord from James Pants that I used on the Brookside Park track. So we're all in this together. <laughs> you actually didn't have to probably give him any money. You could just give him a bowl of curry and he would have been happy. Exactly. Yeah, I should have did that, man. Save yourself some loot. But um, yeah, give a shot. Um, you mentioned warmth and warmth of sound. Um, do you get a different sort of, uh, I don't know, type of warmth from the different uh, voices that you use? And how would you sort of describe, you know, one versus another? Um, yeah, I get, I get a certain warmth from more of the analog stuff. The Korg, I mean, be honest with you, it's cool, but it's, you know, it, it definitely needs some, some, some brush up on the warmth. You know what I'm saying? But, uh, but Korg did make some earlier stuff that's really warm. So, but still great company, Korg, if you're listening. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah. But, um, but yeah, but I like older keyboards, you know what I'm saying, that they give the warmth. And, um, and, and, and it's, I, you, you never want to use the regular patches, please. I mean, just, you got to, you all know this, y'all. I mean, it would be cool to, 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 you know, tweak the sound. Don't just use the regular patch. Don't be lazy, you know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? I, I hope that I'm not offending anybody. It's just, you, sh you, you should always get your own sound at any, it's called a synthesizer because that's what they do. They, you synthesize sound, you know what I'm saying? I would never just use the preset, but, uh, but that's how I come up with my stuff. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, we had, last week we had um, um, Gabriel Roth from this, this record label, Daptone, oh, yeah. who did stuff with uh, Sharon Jones and people like that. And, um, you know, one thing that, um, in some ways you guys are kindred spirits because he does things completely analog himself. But um, he was talking about uh, discipline and discipline within your playing and discipline within, like, um, your, I guess in your, your, your execution of, of um, you know, being one part of a band. Now, you are your own band, more or less. Yes. But at the same time, what I, I, know, I notice from your songs and how they're put together mm -hmm. is they are very disciplined. I mean, the, the, the parts, you know, I think when people think of funk, a lot of times they think, um, you know, a lot of bass slapping on the, on, you know, you know, thumb slapping on the bass, or yes. kind of just sort of getting over uh, embellishing the groove. And I wonder if you could speak on that a little bit, where you, how you feel about that, because that is, in some respects, one characteristic of funk. But your stuff, I feel, is also very disciplined as thank well. You, thank you for noticing that. Um, I do. I practice discipline, and some songs. Uh, I was just talking to somebody about this. Um, we were talking about how today it seems like, and it, it, it's probably again, maybe it's my generation X thing, I don't know. But the newer generation now <clears throat> seems to me that um, this ADD thing is going on. And then like it's a, a, uh, a, a prideful thing, you know, and it's like, that's cool. But it's like, you know, the Beatles were known to take like seven days for one song, you know, maybe even longer, you know what I'm saying? It's like, and now cats are like doing a track in like 30 minutes and that seems to be like the new bragging rights. Yeah, it made that beat in like 10 minutes. You know, it's like, okay, cool. I mean, but is that like, that's dope? You know, it's like, w what if you spent like a little bit more time on it? You know what I'm saying? Just imagine, now I'm even guilty of it. You know what I'm saying? I, I did Hood Pass and Tact in 10 minutes, if you guys ever heard that track. But it's like, um. It's, but that's just because it felt right, and it was like, you know, I just said, let me walk away from this. I know when it's cool, you know what I'm saying? Don't go nuts. So, but sometimes it's fun to, like, see if you can discipline right. yourself to, like, really work on a song. And, like, this track right here, I did about, like, 21 takes of this before I got it right. And um, let me see if I can cue this one up. Okay. This is from the album as well. Um, let me see if it's, yeah, there we go. 
recorded live in Funkmosphere Lab in Los Angeles. I just wanted to show you that, you know, sometimes, you know, I wanted that one, I wanted to make a song like that could be played in the radio and not just a beat. You understand what I'm saying? And I'm, I'm not going to be one of those guys right now to, to condemn, you know, certain ways. Or, but, you know, there is a little difference. You know, when you make, but I have a song called uh, I Don't Just Do Beats, I Do Music. And I'm, and I'm not dissing beats. I, I say it's, it's a just in that title. I just don't do beats. It's, I, I make beats too. But it would be nice to acknowledge cats that still do music. You know what I'm saying? And beats. Don't just look at the guys like, oh, you, you, that, 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 that beat, that's that beat, that's hard. Like, what about the person that does the music too? That's okay, you know, for people to actually construct like a actual song. And you, you know what I'm saying? I'm not being funny or anything. It's like, what, what happened to like appreciating people who do music and not just a beat? So that right there, I wanted to include on this as well, you know, to show that from your question, it was a long answer, but you know, for discipline, you know what I'm saying? That uh, it's, yeah, you definitely want to have some discipline when it comes to making an album these days and music. It'll be nice to hear sometimes. Um, as far as, um, I want to actually sort of on a, I guess, I don't know, more uh, philosophical level. What it, What is, uh, you know, funk is always uh, sort of, so intrinsically linked with like sci-fi imagery and um you know fantasy and things like that and why do you think that is and what about that sort of stuff appeals to you um you know what is it what is i guess if there is a deeper meaning to it what do you think all that imagery represents <coughs> um because funk is uh goes a long way back and uh, it's not a fad, it's a way of life. And, you know, um, I think that from, if you study some of the Funkadelic and Parliament imagery, and even, even Sun Ra, and, you know, a lot of people who, Miles Davis, I mean, uh, a lot of people came before uh, P-Funk, but had the funk ideology. And, and funk, to me, represents, like, the, the back room, if you will, of, like, R&B and soul you know, the dark room in the back of the house, you know what I'm saying? The cousin or bastard child of like those genres, just like metal and like uh, punk are like the bastard childs of like rock, you know what I'm saying? Or like, uh, uh, or country, you know what I mean? Um, and, and funk allows you to think about other things. It opens up another door and uh, it's just a long lineage of that. I like to, you know, incorporate uh, different ways of thinking through funk music, and it's just a t tradition, you know what I mean? And um, it's like I have experiences that I've that I've had that I attribute to funk and the way it is, and it's not a game. It's like um, it's a, it's a way of life, you know what I'm saying? And I mean, it's deep to explain, but uh, I want funk to be respected and I think it is finally again you know because I think commercialism made funk funny you know like even the word got kind of weird to say I'm trying to bring style back to funk I don't want it to be like like I've said before like known for like rainbow afros or like diapers on stage you know what I'm saying it's like it's it's more to it you know what I'm saying it's like it's an ideology and it's about the chords it's about the the tempos it's about the flow. It's about what I said earlier about the hardest gangster and the most beautiful lady that has can have a glass of wine with it at the same time. I want to create that connection, um, class and and the streets together in the same room. That's what I'm trying to do with what I'm with this modern funk. I want to bring everybody in the same room together, but still don't forget about traveling to another galaxy and giving that music to another human, to another uh, species, <laughs> letting them hear them, you bless you. Letting them hear all the uh, music that we're creating. You know what I'm saying? Funk, I think, is the genre that, one of the genres that could, I think, 
that another species or life form could really uh, get into because it's rooted in the motherland, it's rooted in the drums, it's rooted in the first people that were ever on this planet, and it's now being given to everybody in this room and all different people to take to another universe. And, and that's what I think about the funk that, that I'm creating. I want to contribute into that. Yeah, because um, I think, you know, I'm glad you addressed that because I think there is some sort of uh, uh, kitsch or novelty stigma attached, you know, to uh, to the music to some degree. I mean, you know, I was a huge, huge P-Funk fan. And yeah, I loved, I loved the outrageousness of what they were doing. It was, you know, it was groundbreaking to have a guy with right. a diaper on stage playing the guitar and stuff like that. But, um, but it's, you know, I think it, uh, maybe it's just the era that we live in, you know what I mean? But I it seems like everybody's too, you know, it ha everything has to be kind of, I don't know, ironic or, you know, yeah. it, you know, sort of very self-conscious. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of glad that you were able to sort of address that. But, um, and what role would you say escapism has in, 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 in your creativity and, and, you know, your process of how you do things? It has a lot to do with it. I, I mean, the reason why I'm into it is for escapism. I mean, I want to provide the listener for a place to get away to another place. You know what I mean? And uh, um, like I told you about that kid that was sitting in the room with the windows open after ditching school. You know what I'm saying? And listening to the record. I want to provide the music to their sound, to the soundtrack to their lives. And um, it is an escapism. People have things they go through each day uh, in school or at work or whatever. I want to provide a double album like this so that they can get in. Man, let me put this thing on, man, and just get out of this. I just want to just close my eyes and get into this. That's what I want to provide, you know what I'm saying? And something that they can remember, can hold on to, and provide the soundtrack to their lives. And I hope everybody in this room that creates music and art Maybe I hope that's some of the reason that you do it, not just for self-pleasing things, but to help other people as well. Yeah, yeah please yourself, because I please myself with my music, I'm not going to lie. But because it feels good when you complete a song, you know what I'm saying? It gets all that stuff out. Art is about like expressing yourself. But still, I hope you're thinking when you do create art that it helps another person. It's not just all self-serving, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. Now, can you discuss also the, uh, now I know when you do your DJ sets and when you, you, know, you, you do your, I guess your live sets, or they sort of overlap in some ways. Um, you know, in light of the, the, the diaper on stage uh, image, but you also emphasize showmanship. And um, can you talk a little bit about that um, and how you incorporate showmanship into even just a DJ set? Um, yes. Um, I incorporate showmanship in a way that I never want to bore people when they come to one of my shows or sets. I just don't want to be the guy that's just staring at his laptop with a blank expression on his face. You understand what I'm saying? And I hope I didn't hurt anybody's feelings in here. All I'm trying to say is that people deserve when they come to a show to like get like you don't have to be jumping for joy, but it's like you know at least like you know that, look I'm gonna be frank that shit better be good if you're gonna be standing there just looking at the laptop and the blank expression it better be good, you know what I'm saying? But if if but just I say like for me maybe it's a little bit easier from from my particular style because it's like got a bump to it most of it or at least I try to have a bump to it but it's like I just like to make people like feel good and be into it I, I let myself go I'm more of a laid-back person when I'm in like kicking it but on stage I just turn into somebody else and I hope that every artist here can remember that when you get on stage you know people drove you know what I'm saying they took the train they took they went out to the cold they bought the ticket, you know what I'm saying? They actually like thought of you. They actually considered coming to see your ass. You know what I'm saying? And then you get up there and then you like just like acting like you mad. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm mad sometimes too. I have songs that address that, you know, but it's like, you, I just feel that when it comes to showmanship, I like to give people a good show. In this era right now, it's like, I feel good. I used to feel weird. Let me be honest with you. Like I was, you know, doing my thing, like you know, party. I like to party on stage. You know what I'm saying? And I was like, man, nobody else is really partying. Like the people I do gigs <laughs> with. You know what I'm saying? Like all the other artists are kind of like, you know, just doing some other thing. You know. But where I come from, we party. We like, 
it's just you get into it. You know what I'm saying? You 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 like again, you give showmanship. And you know, and I understand there's a, a, a ironic thing, you know, out there, you know what I'm saying, you know, um, and people kind of anti don't want to show, you know what I'm saying, that they're excited and uh, want to get People always out. are too cool, you know, yeah, too, too cool, cool for school. school. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? But um so what sort of things like would you be doing on stage or even during a DJ set or something like that? Like how how would you try to like reach the people? Um well I just I just take it to the natural vibe. I mean if the music is I feed off of the crowd. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, uh for instance in Lisbon, I just keep it recent. In Lisbon, um it was just such an incredible crowd. I mean, it was like it it just it, it, everybody was just partying, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just into it. And I was like, you know, into it too. You know what I mean? And then you'll go to like another gig and like, you know, it'll be like, you know, kind of okay. You know, some people are watching curiously, you know, that kind of thing, you know, but that's something I want you guys to prepare for. When you have gigs, every gig is gonna be dynamite. You know what I'm saying? Don't let that get to you. You know what I'm saying? There's gonna be some people who are just staring at you. And there's also gonna be some people in the audience that like, um. I like they like they think they can do it better than you. You know what I'm saying? It's that's always oh, yeah. gonna be out there. It's it's no big deal. All you gotta do is just rock it for that one person that you know is there. Like what saves me is like when when I can see like one person enjoying it. You know what I'm saying? Then when I look around to see like the the one guy just standing there with that blank expression, I'm like, oh yeah, cool, that's all right. But I'm just gonna keep providing, you know, because I chose to do this. And all of us in this room, we chose to do this. You understand what I'm saying? We chose to be on a stage. This is some serious shit when you think about it because we could be doing something else. You know what I'm saying? Some people are actually looking at us like, how dare you actually choose to get on stage to like live a lifestyle like that? You know what I'm saying? But it's art. We chose art. This is the way we want to live our lives. So I would just say that, you know, deal with all the little things that come with that territory and, and stay strong, you, you know? I mean, everybody here actually shared their DJ horror stories from their past. Do you have okay, one yeah. Do you have one you want to share with us? Just so, we, you know. Um, uh, let me see. Um, um, it's like the great equalizer. Everybody seems to have one. A gr- that's the great equalizer. I feel you. Um, damn. But I'm going to be honest. I, somebody asked me this. I, 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 you know, can I share it like this? You know, I was talking to my lady, right? And I was like, I'm gonna be honest with you. I was talking to her just uh, this last night. I was like, man, it's like, everything's going so cool. You know, I'm just like waiting for something to happen. If I'm gonna have to knock somebody out on stage or like getting crazy or like, am I gonna, when is that gonna happen? Like she was like, you know, man, don't even worry about that. You've always been like waiting for something to happen, waiting for something. I said, you know, just ex- enjoy what's going on. You're not the type of energy, you don't have the type of energy that invites anything bad to happen. And I had to realize that I said, okay, look, maybe maybe it is okay to like not have anything bad happen. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, I, seriously, I have not had anything weird happen yet. And I know I wanna be the great equalizer, but I just haven't had any serious problems yet. I mean, and I just, wish that it can I'm trying to look with some wood somewhere but I just where oh okay yeah all right I think that's metal I don't yeah yeah all right well I just you know thank God but you know um or the universe above for anybody that's too particular in here but um you know what I'm saying uh it's always up for debate but anyway uh that's another story but um yeah, it's like, I just haven't had any horror stories yet, y'all. And I mean, I just want to thank, you know, my lucky stars, if you will. Um, but, but to be equalizer, I guess the only thing I can say is that, like I said earlier, you'll have gigs that aren't as cool as the other one. You know what I'm saying? You kind of wonder, whoa, you know, what was that about? But, oh, okay, all right, I got to tell you. So I, I got to equalize. All right, all right, come on. I got to equalize. Um, it? It's one of my worst... Uh, gigs at my own hometown in Funkmosphere. Um, it was just one of my worst sets. It really wasn't a big deal. But this just shows, again, how I would like to help you guys too. Um, it was one of my worst DJ sets. It was like I was train wrecking, you know what I'm saying? I was, and I, there was one time when I, like before the show, I had like, um, Somebody passed me something, and I like, you know, I was like, man, come on, man, why did I do that? I was thinking it was gonna enhance me, you know what I'm saying? 
And I was like, man, come on, man. Why did I, I don't even trip like that no more. Because I, I don't, you know. So I was like, uh, and, and so I thought, yeah, I'm about to get into this. And I was like, oh, man, this is like one of my worst DJ sets ever at, um, at Funkmosphere in L.A. And I said, I'll never, ever do that again before, um, you know, DJing. So, yeah, it, it, those kind of gigs happen. And you just got to, like, move on to the next one and just keep your head up. And But what I did is I kept it true. Got in the microphone. Much love, y'all. It's one of my worst gigs, y'all. I'm wor worst DJ set, so everybody still clapped and laughed, and you know. But I'm not gonna try to play it off and act like it didn't happen. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, that's how I did it. So it's all good. <laughs> so you just mentioned Funkmosphere. Can you explain what that is and how long you've been doing it? Funkmosphere is a spot I, uh, founded in Los Angeles, California, in Culver City area. Uh, it's been going on for almost four years in July. That's with uh, my DJ friends, Billy Goods, DJ Randy Watson, a.k.a. Ron and LaRage. And uh, we've been uh, hosting people like Ron Trent, um, Chico Man, um, Peanut Butter Wolf, of course. Um, uh, a lot of good cats have, have passed through there. And, um, and we, we focuses on the genre of boogie and uh and funk and um and we play stuff like this yeah give I a little just, example uh, that you hear because you are a connoisseur of, of all this stuff as well oh, oh thank you yeah I, I try to be yeah uh yeah let's see um this is one that i really like i dropped this at plan b uh this particular um yeah, this weekend. This is a track, a rare 45. This is the kind of stuff we play there. This is released in 1981 out of Los Angeles. And um, it's a group called LS Movement. It's called Move, Every Move Everything You Got. I'm going to start that from the beginning. And Benny Blanco can attest this. They're the London side of, of the boogie movement, which we're doing. And Benny's right there. Much love to Benny. Can you guys give him a round of applause? Yeah, give Ben a round of applause. Yeah. He's, so we're he's been working this. hard for you guys this, this, <laughs> this past 10 days or so. So we all international. We're trying to keep yeah. the boogie funk alive and, and then take funk into different categories and territories. And we appreciate you guys giving us a chance to share this type of music. Yeah. Now, I, I guess I skipped over the part where you actually got signed to Stone's Throw. Can you just sort of mention how, how um, Wolf, I guess Wolf came across, you know, your stuff and how did that happen? Yeah, um, well, we started seeing each other, um, for instance, like I would go look at his DJ sets around L.A. Um, uh, he was DJing at a place called Star Shoes uh, one night, and uh, he did an all-1983 set. And see, a lot of people know Wolf for just um, a lot of the backpack hip-hop stuff. But um, he's also into all styles of music, which we talked about earlier. It's great to be into all styles of music, but, um, but you could still stand for something. Uh, but... The point is, is that uh, um, being so well-rounded in music, he had collected funk as well. You know what I mean? Like Slave, the group I was talking to you about, um, One Way, Prince, very into Prince, which I didn't know. Um, and so when when I walked into this club and he was playing this stuff, I was like, damn, you know, this is this dude really has it. You know, and I looked at who's the DJ, and it's like, damn, it's Wolf. You know what I'm saying? And, and then so, you know, we, we linked up and... Um, we started talking about Steve Arrington, of course, which I want to play you one of the tracks before this is all over, give you guys a premiere of what's coming out on Stone's Throw under Steve Arrington. But, uh, um, but so he just started coming to Funkmosphere, and I invited him to spin at my spot. And uh, so he did, and he did his 777 thing, and we just built up, and then he, I left a comment during the great days of MySpace. You remember that? Yeah. All right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Much love to MySpace. I owe a lot to them, so I'm not laughing at them. It's a great, great site. But um, uh, so I left a comment on Baron Zinn's page. It was uh, the cat who was on Stone's Throw who did this great little weird out of the album of like a lot of stuff, Baron Zinn. And so it came time for uh, remixes to be done. And um, and he all, he's, I left a message on Baron Zinn's innocently, you know what I'm saying? Innocently, I was like, "Yeah, Barons, I like the track." You know, then all of a sudden, Wolf hits me like, "Man, I, I saw you left a, a comment on Baron Zinn's page. I didn't know you liked that stuff." I said, "Yeah, I like all styles of music." And then, um, man, we're doing a remix project. Man, I, I heard some of your stuff in your MySpace page. I liked it. I said, "Okay, thanks, man." And uh, so he said, "Hey, I want to see if you want to do a remix for uh, you know one of the tracks." And after I tell you after this, like uh, I just tell you the human thing. Um, after the phone call, I swear to God. 
I, I hung up the phone and I just like I, I hung up the phone. I was like, so I like went over to the other part of the room and I just said, "Thank you, God. Thank you, God. This dude, I'm finally putting something out on my own. No rap sessions. No, none of this stuff. Thank you, God." I was like, "Man," I, so I got up off my knees and. And you know, he was like, Wolf just believed in the sound, you know what I'm saying, from the MySpace page. And so then I did Burn Rubber. Here's one more thing. How are we doing on time? We're doing all right, man. Cool. All right. This is a very important little thing for everybody in here. So I did the Burn Rubber. Uh, I, I was, he gave me the go ahead to do this thing, right? Because first, another incredible cat, Mad Lib, was doing a remix on the album too. And I turned down and said, I would do Shoes, this track that Baron Zinn had. And um, they said, oh no, Wolf's, I mean, uh, uh, Mad Lib's doing that. I was like, okay, cool, damn, what am I gonna do? So at the end of the album, there's this thing at the end of the CD, Burn Rubber, where Baron Zinn was just screaming on it for like a minute. He took the original Burn Rubber from the Gap Band and uh, you got it. Here? You got it here. You can throw it on. Burn too. rubber. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll play Remix. that in the background while I'm talking. And uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, he um, uh, he basically uh, told me, yeah, why don't you go ahead and you know just I, I said I like burn rubber. I'll do something with that. And then uh, he was like, oh okay, uh, go ahead. It's just like a little uh, instrumental or whatever. Uh, I mean, a little short track. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and then, so basically, this is the track that we're referring to, and I'll just get into it, the other part of the conversation. I walked around, like I said, where am I gonna record this at? I don't know what to do with this, you know what I'm saying? But I ended up recording this track, and I had to lay Baron Zinn's voice. He get, Wolf sent me the acapellas, as you guys already know, you know what I'm saying, about doing a remix. He gets, they call, send you the parts, and, um, and I laid his voice on top of it like this. Um, now, mind you, the original was his voice just without a vocoder, but I'll tell you the story in a minute. Pause. Okay, I have to tell you this part. Mm -hmm. So I turned in the first version with his vocal without a vocoder, right? Okay. And check this out. This is a lesson for everybody. I turned it in. He's like, oh, man, that's dope what you did with the music. But the vocals just off key. It's like I don't like the way Baron Zinn's vocals sound in there. Then just all the work I did, you know what I'm saying? I was like, damn, you know, like, I, I, what am I? I don't want to. Uh, he's telling me no. And then my, the fears after me getting on my knees praying and like, you know, this might lose out of my fingertips, you know. So I was like, um, and then so being the good guy that Wolf is, he's like, why don't you try something like running this voice through a, 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 a machine or some kind of effects? And then I was like, uh, we both like uh, came up with the vocoder. You know what I'm saying? The vocoder, that's it. You know, and um, so I think Wolf actually came with the vocoder uh, idea. So I said, cool, let's do it. So I went back to the studio again. The remix still not approved. Now, mind you, like, the reason why I'm telling you is because if you ever get discouraged, don't just throw up your hands like, I mean, like, you know, forget this dude, man. I'm not going to do this. Go. I did all this work, man. Forget it. And then, uh, so I ended up doing it. And that's, I ended up running through the vocoder and I turned it into Wolf. And he's like, oh, man, this is the one. This is the one. So, uh, synthesizer keyboard that I strap on my shoulders. I don't like to call it a keytar anymore, you know, so. Um, but I just call it a synth axe or, you know, something like that, you know what I mean? But see what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to change the cornball effect of funk that we used to have, rainbow afros and, and everybody laughing at the guitar, you know, thing. It's like, you know, it's this is serious business, you know what I'm saying? It's like uh, all that synthesizer is is something for keyboards to be able to, to be free on stage, you know what I'm saying? So Jan Hammer and those kind of cats kind of, you know, it looked kind of weird, it got kind of weird in the 80s. <laughs> yeah, much love to Jan Hammer, he's incredible. But I'm just saying, like, during that time, you know, that instrument got stigmatized, and I'm trying to bring something different to a few things I'm involved in, that's all. To bring it to our, our table, that's all. So, but through, it was through the remix then that you got yeah. official, your own official After that, solo I releases. mean, cats like J-Rock and, you know, and the DJs across the world started playing that track and, you know, um, and I really appreciated it. And, you know, uh, Benji B, great uh, cat from your town, um, you know, supported a lot of things and, you know, and um, 
and it was all natural. None of this was no kind of like, um, like uh, favors or anything like that. Everything I did was natural, you know what I'm saying? I would suggest to everybody here to stick with the natural vibe, you know, and be careful when you do the demo submitting, you know what I'm saying? There's one little thing, I gotta share this with you guys. It's like, when you do the demo thing, it's like, um, just do it in a way, I can't even explain it, but it's just like, it has to be more natural. Like, I never forget what Leon told me. Leon Silver, you said that the industry is built on relationships. You know, sometimes it's not gonna work if you just like go, no matter how big your dream is, it's not gonna work, here's my CD, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, somebody might listen to it, but it's just sometimes it's just so much going on in somebody's head that it might not be the right way to approach. You might have to have give it to a third party, you know what I'm saying? Like, or just set up something like, you know, like, yeah, you know, like, uh, or, or at least have a genuine conversation first instead of just like, yo, 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 let me get, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, like kind of thing. Sometimes that works, but it's just, I don't know, man. It's like, you just, it's too, it's, it's too many ways that you can use, do things now to get your music heard. And, and that way, sometimes it's not a trip. But, but fortunately, you're looking at somebody that actually does listen to demos. But I'm just letting you guys know about other cats. It, that, that aggressiveness doesn't, doesn't really work well with people. You know what I'm saying? It just works naturally. Like I said, with that MySpace thing, that was just all natural. You know, yeah, I wasn't trying to get on no label. It's the right place in the right time. Um, I do want to hear the Steve Arrington thing before we open things up for questions, um, you know, from, from everybody. No problem. Yeah. So, um, what stage is the, is the, uh, is the album at now? Is it, and when can we, uh, expect this is going to drop? Uh, it should be out. I would hope that it would be out by summertime. Uh, we've recorded 10 tracks together. Uh, and, you know, it's one of those things where, we have to get, we're gonna do a very serious project with this. And I've, mm -hmm. I've I have a promise from Wolf that, you know, that this will be a very well thought out project because Steve Arrington is owed that respect. I feel that he's one of the best overlooked vocalists in funk. He's one of the best and uh, he's still incredible. And um, he just deserves the respect and he's one of my heroes. And, um, and, and I think that it'll be out by the summertime, hopefully. Okay, so let's hear a little here's bit. Here's a, yeah, here's something that Dame we... Dame Funk and we, Steve Arrington. No problem. Yeah, this is called uh, The Way I Feel About You. A little modern funk for you. Yeah. It's a world premiere. Yeah, world premiere. Steve Arrington, Dame Funk collaboration, y'all. One of my heroes, I'm slave, y'all. Nice. I um, want to open things up to questions at no this problem. point. Yeah, so. yeah, no problem. All right, yeah. I didn't even want to talk that long. That's cool, though. Thank you for allowing me to do that. Yeah. I think we, <laughs> got, we got one young fellow over here who's got a question. Thank What's you. happening? Yeah. Hi. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Um, <laughs> this is a lot. <laughs> All right. Um, so many things to ask. I'll just like round them up into like one long question. You mentioned like um, still sequence your drums and stuff. Like, um, so do you like get new drum sounds, use a different drum sequence, or is it still same overhang thing? And then um, the one of the songs you played, like I, I noticed that it was only like three sounds: the bass, the keyboard, and like a string line going how do you get it to sound so rich is it like the way the synthesizers are like you can't get that with like digital stuff and then um in what advice would you have for someone that like like in my home country the kind of music i do where's your home country nigeria cool uh, the kind of music i want to do is not really like stuff that appeals to like people so how how do I break out of that into a place where people appreciate my music? Yeah. Uh, I would just do it uh, from the heart. Keep doing what you do. Don't change, man. You know, because look at me. I was doing stuff like this. You heard what I started off with in 88. You know what I'm saying? I just stuck with what I did. I'm basically doing the same thing, using the same drum machine, using the same keyboards. Like I said, I'm not playing. I'm using the same instruments that I used back then up until now and to each his own. And um, the reason that it sounds warm is because um, it was uh, recorded, like I said earlier, uh, through analog keyboards and through 
uh, the uh, recording it all the way live through. See, sometimes the digital stuff, it, it may be the sequencing that makes it not sound as human as it should be. So I like to do more human times technology. Um, I really don't want to sound like a jam band, you know what I'm saying? I like to say, I want to sound human, but I still want to sound futuristic. So I use technology to my um, uh, benefit, but I don't let the technology run me. You understand what I'm saying? So I rather challenge myself, like, and you do the elbow grease, like, uh, I'm going to record it all the way live through instead of sequencing. So that's what I suggest to you if you want to hear, have a more warm sound. Maybe try it, you know, playing live all the way through or using some older equipment that, that suits you. But, um, you know, um, but it's all good. Every, every way to record is cool. I'm sure the cats out there to record digitally have ways to make it sound warm. Check with them as well. And what's your take on auto-tune? Um, auto tune is just a choice, you know what I'm saying? I, I would never use it, but uh, but I, I like vocoders and I like the talk box. Uh, but Do you play the talk box? Yeah, I played it before, but I don't use oh, it on nice. this album. Yeah. yeah, I don't really like that tube in my mouth. You it's know tough saying? though, isn't it? Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Go ahead and answer the question. <laughs> yeah, I, I like vocoders, I don't really, I like, I prefer the vocoder over the talk box. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your question. Yeah. Um, yeah. First of all, I would like to say you're the shit, man. Oh, thank you, man. I, I yeah. appreciate it. <laughs> much love. You have a appreciate big, big it. fan down in Dominican Republic, man. Yeah. Oh, much love, man. I appreciate that. Much yeah. respect. My question is that, like, do you got, like, any musical training whatsoever, or you do it all by ear, or what? All by ear. Shit. It's okay. Even it's more okay. amazing, man. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. But I give it up to the students of music. I give it up to you. You know what I'm saying? It's just, I just do mine like this. I have, I had had drum lessons. I was in a jazz band in school. But as you know, a lot of us who were in the bands in school and had those those papers in front of us, yeah, we absolutely. just wanted to play. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You know. But I commend the cats that went to school for music. Much respect. Thanks for your question. Who else? Question for Dame. <laughs> Hi. How you doing? I'm great. Cool. What's your opinion about guys like George Clinton and Butchie Cullen s still out there doing their shit like it's 1970? Is that good for the genre? Or what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's good for the genre. Um, I love Bootsy. I love George. I think they're just great artists. And, um, you know, I actually think they deserve more respect. It seems like that you have to pass away in order to get the respect that, uh, that people give. You know, these cats are actually outliving everybody, you know what I'm saying? And they're doing everything. They're still free. You know, George does. Uh, he's free. Put it like that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And he's still doing his thing. And he deserves all the accolades that any other Mick Jagger does. You know what I'm saying? I, I say that with respect, but George and Boosie deserve the respect that some of those greats have. So I, I, I have much respect for them. Um, I just would like to continue the funk. You know, it, it just play my part. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. No problem. Thanks for your question. Thanks. Hey. Um, Hi. Uh, sometimes I have a good friend of mine, and he likes to play your music when he's driving and stuff. He also is a DJ, and he plays a lot of your stuff. Oh, cool. And Thank you. when it's playing, he always gets a smile on his face, and he's, he turns to me, he's like, music you could hold your girl's hand to. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know? That's cool. And um, I just want to... <laughs> Yeah, I just want to, it's basically more of a comment. I just want to say I really appreciate, I really like um, funk music as well. It's something that my dad used to play. And uh, one of my favorite songs is like Funky Worm, the Ohio oh, Players. Oh, yeah, yeah, Junie Morrison on that one. Right? kills it. <laughs> and so I just wanted to basically just thank you for, you know, being true to your genre and, you know, bringing it back. I appreciate that, my sister. I do. Thank you for that. I do. I'm going to keep on doing it, too, for everybody. All right. 